What's going on? Um, a friend of ours is dead in his bedroom. We, we hadn't heard from him for a while. We think he's dead. His roommate just went in there and, and said there's lots of blood. I didn't go in, but I, I can give you the phone to someone who went in there. Can, yes, please, can you? Hello. Hi, so what's going on? He's... Uh, he he's dead. He's in his bedroom okay. in in the shower. Okay. How did this happen? Do you have any idea? No, we have no idea. Everyone's been wondering about him okay. for well, a few said, days. Well, she said that there was blood. So is it coming from his head? Did he? Cut no, his head? I, it, I, it's all over the place. Is there any weapons around? I no, I don't know. I not that I saw. I need all of you outside. Has he been threatened by anyone recently? Yes, he has. Okay. He has a he has an ex girlfriend that's been bothering him and and um following him and slashing tires and things like that. And do you know the ex girlfriend's name? Um, um, do you remember? Yeah. What what's his ex girlfriend's name? That's Taylor. What's that? And do you know if he's ever reported it to the police? Um, her, his, her name is Jody. No, he hasn't reported anything about Jody's behavior. In 2013, Jody Arias made headlines after she was convicted for the murder of her ex-boyfriend, Travis Alexander. Two years later, in 2015, Arias admits to the act, and she's sentenced to life imprisonment. But the story isn't just black and white. Was Arias driven by sociopathic intent, meticulously planning Alexander's demise, or has a narrative of self-defense been overshadowed by the crime's brutality? Let's find out. Mesa, Arizona a city with a vibrant population of about 504,258 balances modern living with its rich history. Known for its dynamic blend of recreational and historic sites, Mesa offers a unique lifestyle. Here, community life thrives among parks, museums, and art galleries, reflecting a strong cultural pulse. The people of Mesa are diverse, contributing to a lively social fabric. However, crime is part of the story too with a rate slightly higher than the national average. This backdrop sets the scene with the discovery of 30-year-old Travis Alexander's body, a death in which his ex-girlfriend Jody Arias was convicted for, marking a dark chapter in Mesa's history. Jody Ann Arias was born on July 9, 1980, in Salinas, California. Jody Arias came from a typical, normal, middle-class family from Wairica, California. Her parents, William and Sandra Arias, provided a normal upbringing. However, Jody's behavior during her youth hinted at underlying issues. She showed signs of rebellion early on, notably in eighth grade when her own family caught her growing marijuana. This incident, leading to her parents turning her into the police, sowed seeds of deep-seated resentment. Throughout her teenage years, Jody worked as a waitress in her family's restaurant. She often painted her childhood as troubled claiming to suffer physical and emotional abuse, though these allegations remained unproven in court. As a teenager, Jody faced various personal challenges. By the end of her junior year in high school, after repeatedly skipping class, she was grounded until 18. This punishment seemed to be the last straw for her, leading to her dropping out of school and moving in with an older boyfriend, asserting that she was in love. Jody's life at this point was marked by uncertainty and a quest for identity. Her relationship with the older man eventually ended, propelling her to seek something more fulfilling than her job as a waitress. Jody's life took a turn when she discovered a multi-level marketing company, Prepaid Legal. This opportunity intrigued her enough to radically change her life. She dyed her hair blonde, packed her belongings, and relocated to Palm Springs, hoping for a fresh start. Her involvement with Prepaid Legal was more than just a career move. It led her to a conference in Las Vegas where she met Travis Alexander, a young, successful salesman known for his motivational speaking and devout Mormon faith. This meeting marked a pivotal point in Judy's life, intertwining her path with Travis's in ways that would later unfold into a complex and tragic narrative. Travis Alexander, born on July 28, 1977, in Riverside, California, was the son of Gary David Alexander and Pamela Elizabeth Morgan Alexander. His early life took a significant turn at age 8 when he moved in with his parental grandparents. This shift came after experiencing a challenging upbringing marked by turmoil within his family. The death of his father in July 1997 further impacted his life. 
leading to him and his seven siblings being taken in by their grandmother. Despite the adversities, Travis had a dynamic personality. Before he found a steadier path in life, he was known among friends for his rough and tumble nature, often getting involved in fights. I mean, both his parents were drug addicts. Um, him and his siblings were raised by his grandmother, actually, um, and they struggled to get by. Um, they did not have much money. He was a good guy. We went on trips together. Um, we talked a lot about philosophy and personal development and how to be a better person. He was very uh, gregarious, very social, very easy to get along with with other people. Um, and, and that attracted a lot of friends and, and a lot of women. However, this penchant for confrontation didn't define him entirely. He had a creative side, performing stand-up comedy under the pseudonym Eddie Snell, showcasing a knack for humor and entertainment. Professionally, Travis Alexander made his mark as a salesman and motivational speaker for prepaid legal services, where he excelled and became well-known. His career in motivational speaking and sales was not just a job, but a reflection of his desire to improve himself and inspire others. This role put him in contact with many people, including Jody Arias. In the bustling atmosphere of the MGM Grand Hotel and Casino in autumn 2006, Jodi Arias found herself in a serendipitous moment that would pivot the direction of her life. While waiting for a friend, she crossed paths with Travis Alexander, a chance encounter that blossomed into a defining chapter for both. Travis, drawn to the young blonde, introduced himself, setting the stage for a fateful intertwining of their destinies. That evening, Travis invited Jodi to an executive banquet, marking her entry into a world far removed from her own experiences. For Jodi, Accustomed to serving rather than mingling with the upscale crowd, the experience was both exhilarating and intoxicating. This moment of validation and attention sparked a connection between them, a bond that quickly deepened as Travis invited her into his world. Despite the geographical distance, with Jody living in Palm Springs and Travis in Mesa, Arizona, they nurtured their budding romance through phone calls and visits. Travis, a devout Mormon, introduced Jody to his faith encouraging her to explore the teachings of his church. Jody, captivated by the prospect of a life and family within his faith, showed eagerness to embrace it, expressing desires to marry in the temple and live according to its principles. Their relationship, fueled by mutual attraction and shared aspirations, led them to meet halfway between their cities in Ehrenberg, Arizona. Here, they checked into a motel, a decision that symbolized their commitment to making their relationship work despite the challenges posed by distance. The relationship between Jody Arias and Travis Alexander quickly escalated into a passionate and physical one. Despite the intense connection, it lacked emotional depth and tenderness, primarily driven by sexual desires. Travis, publicly a devout Mormon, upheld the faith precept of abstaining from premarital sex, yet privately, he navigated a conflicting personal life. This duality revealed a complex persona, juggling a public image with private actions that contradicted his outward beliefs. Jody, fully immersed in this relationship, envisioned a future with Travis, seeing him as her ideal partner. Her frequent calls and messages after their meetings portrayed her deep investment in this relationship. Travis, however, didn't reciprocate her seriousness. While he enjoyed the physical aspects of their relationship, he didn't see Jody as wife material. This disparity in their emotional investment began to strain their interactions. The dynamic took a more serious turn when Jody decided to convert to Mormonism, expressing a desire to fully integrate into Travis's life and faith. She saw this as a step towards solidifying their bond, with Travis even baptizing her, a moment that seemed significant and heartfelt at the time. However, doubts lingered about the authenticity of Jody's conversion and whether it was a genuine embrace of faith or a strategic move to win Travis over. As the relationship progressed, Travis's attention veered towards other women, leaving Jody feeling isolated and increasingly desperate to secure a committed relationship. Despite her efforts to please and her willingness to be discreet, Travis maintained a distance, avoiding acknowledging her publicly as his girlfriend. This situation brewed a mix of emotions and tension, with Jody pushing for exclusivity and recognition signs of a deepening obsession and emotional turmoil on her part. In Travis's social circle, Jody felt like an outsider, and her interactions with him grew fraught with unmet expectations and emotional distress. She was not content being a mere sexual partner and sought a deeper commitment, which Travis was reluctant to provide. 
This imbalance in their relationship desires and expectations set a complex and troubled foundation, leading to mounting frustrations and a sense of rejection for Jody. while Travis appeared conflicted, enjoying the present but evasive about a future together. In the summer of 2007, Travis Alexander, a young businessman, found himself entangled in a relationship with Jodi Arias that was becoming increasingly perilous due to her obsession. Realizing the potential danger and acknowledging that his feelings were never about love, Travis decided to end the relationship. This decision stemmed from understanding the toxic dynamics at play, where the relationship served more his physical desires than emotional connection. Travis's friends and family supported his decision, advising that moving on was the best course of action if things didn't work out. Despite this clear end, Jody struggled with the breakup, making a drastic decision to move to Travis's hometown of Mesa, Arizona, in an attempt to maintain their connection. This move, however, was against Travis's wishes. He had expressed no desire for her to be closer, contrary to Jody's claims. Even after the breakup, Jody remained entangled in Travis's life, offering to clean his house, to which he agreed, maintaining a complex relationship where personal boundaries were increasingly blurred. Travis began to date Lisa Anders, a young Mormon woman who aligned more with the ideals he publicly upheld, seeking a relationship founded on shared values and morals rather than mere physical attraction. Upon discovering Travis's new relationship, Jody's actions took a darker turn. She sent an alarming email to Lisa, full of accusations and vitriol exposing her volatile state. This email, unmistakably from Judy, shocked everyone and signaled the escalating severity of her obsession. It marked a significant turning point, shedding light on her instability and setting off alarms among Travis's friends and family. This incident revealed the deepening crisis as Jody's inability to accept the breakup manifested in increasingly concerning behavior, indicating the extent of her fixation on Travis. One night in the summer of 2007, as Travis Alexander and his new interest Lisa were at home, they experienced the unnerving event of Jody Arias. This act was a clear indication of Jody's refusal to accept the breakup, showcasing her growing obsession with Travis. Her actions escalated further as she physically invaded his space, sneaking into his house through a pet door, an action that starkly illustrated the severity of her fixation. Jody's diary entry from August 2, 2007 reveals the depth of her turmoil and obsession, expressing a wish to extinguish her feelings for Travis, as if turning off a light switch or cutting the circuit entirely. Despite these intense emotions, in late March of 2008, Jody attempted to distance herself by moving back to Northern California to live with her grandparents. However, the separation did little to diminish her obsession with Travis. As Travis moved on, meeting Mimi Hall from his church, whom he considered marriage material, Jody's jealousy intensified. Learning about Travis's planned trip to Cancun with Mimi only fueled her anger, perceiving it as the ultimate betrayal. Meanwhile, Travis continued to engage in long-distance sexual conversations with Judy, complicating the situation further. This behavior, marked by Travis hiding Judy from his friends and family, led her to feel used and deepened her resentment. The toxicity of their relationship escalated as Judy resorted to recording their private phone conversations, possibly as leverage or blackmail. The way you know, Judy, it sounds like, it sounds like you're just 12 years old, or I don't know if you're sure again, it's, it's so hot. It sounds like, it sounds like what? 12 year old girl, I don't know if you're sure again. <laughs> like, Jody secretly records these conversations and now she's got blackmail material. She even mailed Travis pamphlets about pedophilia, pushing the conflict to extreme levels. Travis's reactions to these actions was one of intense anger and revulsion, labeling Judy with harsh condemning words and indicating his growing resentment and recognition of her manipulative behavior. Their interaction spiraled into a cycle of revenge and retaliation, each act more destructive than the last, highlighting the toxicity of their relationship. This destructive pattern made clear that their conflict was not heading towards a resolution, but rather a tragic culmination. Judy's actions, driven by a mix of obsession and desperation, and Travis's responses, fraught with frustration and anger, set the stage for an inevitable and tragic confrontation. A week before Travis Alexander's murder, 
A reported burglary at Jody's Aria's grandparents' home marked the beginning of a sinister plan. Among the stolen items was a .25 caliber handgun, which police later speculated Jody had taken to arm herself for the ultimate act against Travis. This event wasn't just a random theft, it was a calculated move in Jody's scheme, laying the groundwork for what was to come. In the days leading up to the murder, Jody undertook several steps to ensure her actions would go unnoticed. She dyed her naturally blonde hair back to brown, perhaps to avoid recognition or to symbolize a return to her former self. On June 2nd, Jody rented a car in Redding, California, choosing a location 100 miles from her home to avoid drawing attention. Her actions became increasingly calculated. She removed the front license plate and inverted the rear one, making the car difficult to identify. Jody's preparations included purchasing three five-gallon gas containers filled to ensure she wouldn't need to stop for fuel, thus avoiding surveillance cameras and gas stations. She also turned off her cell phone to prevent her location from being tracked through cellular signals. These meticulously planned actions were all aimed at making her trip to Mesa, Arizona, where Travis lived, completely untraceable. The journey to Mesa took nearly 15 hours, a trip Jody undertook with chilling precision and forethought. She arrived at Travis's home at 4.30 a.m., stealthily entering through the garage after inputting a code into the security keypad, a sign of her intimate knowledge of his household and routines. Upon entering Travis's home unnoticed, Jody Arias found herself once again in close proximity to him. Despite the inappropriate nature of her arrival, Travis didn't turn her away. Instead, they spent considerable time together, engaging in sexual activities and photographing each other in intimate and vulnerable states. This period of apparent reconciliation was short-lived, however, culminating in a sudden and tragic turn of events. The day of the murder unfolded with a disturbing normalcy, as Travis and Jody shared moments that would soon precede a brutal act of violence. After taking photos in the shower, the situation escalated rapidly. Within minutes, the atmosphere shifted from one of intimacy to one of horror. Travis, caught off guard and vulnerable, was first struck with a knife by Jody. Given Travis's physical advantage over Jody, it's believed that the initial knife attack was a critical blow, incapacitating him enough to prevent any effective defense. The violence intensified as Jody attacked Travis relentlessly, inflicting up to 30 stab wounds and a near decapitating slash across his neck. The brutal assault culminated with a gunshot to the head, a final act in what appeared to be a rage-fueled onslaught. After the murder, Jody dragged Travis's body back to the shower, attempting to wash away the evidence of her heinous act. In a vain effort to conceal the crime, Jody washed the bloody sheets and clothing, including the camera that held images of their final hours together. A bloody palm print on the wall, mingling her DNA with Travis's, stood as a silent witness to the events linking her irrevocably to the crime scene. This evidence would later become a crucial part of the case against her, as it illustrated the violent and premeditated nature of her actions. After the murder, Jody Arias meticulously continued to construct her alibi, embarking on a drive to Utah to visit a former co-worker. Her journey took a brief detour when a police officer stopped her for having an upside-down rear license plate a result of her earlier attempt to make her vehicle less identifiable. She explained the way the oddity is a prank, and when asked about the stain on her hands, she responded by saying it was a result of injuries from gardening mishaps, narrowly avoiding suspicion. Upon returning the rental car, having accumulated nearly 3,000 miles on it, Jody's elaborate plan to distance herself from the crime seemed momentarily secure. Meanwhile, Travis's absence had begun to alarm his friends, especially Mimi Hall, who was puzzled by his uncharacteristic silence, knowing they had plans to travel to Mexico together. This concern led Mimi and a group of Travis's friends to make a grim discovery in his home on June 9th. Behind the locked bedroom door, they found Travis's mutilated body, a sight that shocked and horrified them. Travis's friends instantly made a call to the police to report his frantic death. Friend of ours is dead in his bedroom. We, we hadn't heard from him for a while. We think he's dead. Has he been threatened by anyone recently? Yes, he has. Okay. He has a, an ex-girlfriend that's been bothering him and, and um, following him and slashing tires and things like that. And do you know the ex-girlfriend's name? 
Um, her, his, her name is Jody. With immediate suspicion cast upon Jody, known to have harassed Travis after their breakup, the discovery of Travis's body and the subsequent notification to his friends and family sent shockwaves through their community. Daniel, one of Jody's close friends in Arizona, decided to call Jody to inform her of Travis's death. Jody's reaction was of distress and disbelief, though her mourning was seen through a lens of suspicion by those aware of her tumultuous relationship with Travis. Jody's decision to attend Travis's memorial service, despite the growing suspicions against her, stunned those in attendance. Her boldness in introducing herself to Mimi and mingling among Travis's grieving loved ones raised eyebrows and fueled whispers about her possible involvement in his death. This action, coupled with her known history with Travis, placed her firmly at the center of the investigation and speculation. Ten days following the grim discovery of Travis Alexander's murder, Mesa, Arizona detectives headed to Northern California to meet with Jody Arias, who had quickly become their prime suspect. During the interrogation, Jody's behavior was peculiar. Footage from the session shows her singing and even standing on her head when the police were out of the room, actions not typically expected from someone in such serious police custody. I didn't hear you breathe. I wonder how am I still here? The stars are brightly shining. This is the <laughs> the detectives confronted Jody with evidence from the digital camera found at the crime scene, including photos of her and Travis together in the day he was murdered, and crucially, images inadvertently captured during the attack. One such photo seemed to depict Travis's bloody body being dragged, implicating Jody directly in the act. On July 9th, bolstered by this damning evidence, Jody was indicted for first degree murder. Following her arrest at her grandparents' house, Jody's incarceration became a media spectacle, partly due to the controversial Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio, known for his media friendly policies. Arpaio allowed journalists to interview Jody extensively providing her with a platform that she seemed to relish, despite the gravity of her situation. During this time, Jody's demeanor and comments to the press revealed her complex personality, showing a woman who seemingly craved the attention, turning her criminal trial into a platform for personal notoriety. In her interactions with the media, Jody oscillated between victim and celebrity, often appearing more concerned with her newfound fame than the serious charges she faced. She notably participated in a singing contest while in jail, which she won, bragging about this minor victory as if it were a talent show rather than a detention for a severe crime. Initially, Jody denied her involvement in Travis's death, suggesting ludicrously that two masked intruders were the perpetrators. However, as the case progressed, her narrative shifted dramatically. She then claimed to have been present at the scene, ultimately confessing to killing Travis, but insisting it was in self-defense was screaming and I was by the bathtub. I remember putting my hand on his back because he was on his, all four of his knees. He was like on his knees like this, doing something like this or something like, I don't know. And I was like, I was like, are you okay? What's going on? What's going on? He's like, go get help, go get help. And I said, okay. And I, Turned around, there two people there. One was a guy and one was a girl. A claim that starkly contrasted her earlier denials and added a new layer of complexity to the investigation. This turn in her story transformed the nature of the legal proceedings from a question of who did it to why she did it. During the pre-trial phase for Jody Arias, legal maneuvers and court orders shaped the buildup to her trial. On April 6, 2009, the court faced a significant motion from Arias' defense team, aiming to disqualify the Maricopa County District Attorney's Office from the case. However, this motion was denied, maintaining the prosecutorial team's involvement. Subsequently, on May 18th, the court mandated that Arias undergo IQ and competency testing 
a crucial step to ensure she was fit to stand trial and fully understood the charges against her. This decision underscored the legal system's requirement to treat defendants fairly, ensuring they are capable of participating in their defense. The defense's pursuit of evidence was a pivotal aspect of the pre-trial process. Initially, the prosecution claimed that no text messages sent or received by the victim, Travis Alexander, were available. This stance changed following court orders, leading to the revelation that several hundred text messages existed and needed to be shared with the defense. This moment marked a significant turn in the evidence-gathering phase, raising questions about evidence management and disclosure. Furthermore, in June 2009, Mesa Police Detective Esteban Flores informed the defense about Travis Alexander's emails, stating they were not unusual. The defense eventually received approximately 8,000 emails, a substantial volume that offered a more comprehensive view of Alexander's personal communications and possibly provided insights into his life and relationship with Arias. The trial of Jody Arias, which captured national attention, began with a representation by appointed counsel L. Kirk Nurmi and Jennifer Wilmot. The proceedings kicked off in the Maricopa County Superior Court, overseen by Judge Sherry K. Stephens. Jury selection commenced on December 10, 2012, marking the start of a trial filled with legal complexities and public scrutiny. During the jury selection process, an issue arose concerning the makeup of the jury panel. Arias's attorneys raised concerns that the proceedings was systematically excluding women and black individuals from the jury. Prosecutor Juan Martinez countered these claims, asserting that his decisions to strike certain jurors were based on factors irrelevant to race or sex. After considering these arguments, Judge Stephens concluded that there was no evidence of bias in the jury selection process and ruled accordingly. During the guilt phase of Jody Arias' trial, the courtroom was divided by two starkly contrasting narratives. The prosecution depicted Arias as driven by jealousy to murder Travis Alexander, a man they described as virtuous and attempting to distance himself from a toxic relationship. They argued the murder was premeditated, pointing to the staged burglary at Arias' grandparents' home to acquire a .25 caliber handgun, the same type used to kill Alexander. The prosecution further emphasized Arias' calculated measures to obscure her visit to Alexander's residence, including the purchase of gas in advance to avoid leaving a digital trail. Witness Ryan Burns added to the prosecution's portrayal by noting Arias' demeanor as surprisingly normal during her visit to him just a day after Alexander's murder. Despite Arias' claim of injuring her hands on broken glass at a non-existent restaurant, the prosecution's case was punctuated with shocking evidence including nude photos of Arias and Alexander to challenge the credibility of Arias's defense and character witnesses. Conversely, Arias's defense presented a narrative of self-defense and victimization. Arias took the stand, offering a marathon testimony over 18 days where she recounted alleged abuse by her parents, detailed her sexual relationship with Alexander, and claimed Alexander had pedophilic tendencies she tried to help him address. She described their relationship's escalating violence, culminating in an incident where she allegedly killed Alexander in self-defense after he attacked her. The defense called Alice LaViolette, a psychotherapist specializing in domestic violence, to argue that Arias was a victim of abuse by Alexander. LaViolette's testimony aimed to support Arias's claims to self-defense, suggesting that her reactions were consistent with those of an abused victim. Attempts by the defense to introduce emails between Alexander and his friends as evidence of his abusive behavior were blocked by the judge, ruling them as hearsay. As time went on, a 2011 court filing shed light on email exchanges that reflected the complexities of their relationship. Travis expressed frustration over the Hughes couple dissuading Arias from pursuing him romantically, revealing Travis's own acknowledgement of being somewhat sociopathic. Chris Hughes, in these emails, warned of Arias's potential to be a victim of Travis's manipulative tendencies, suggesting a pattern of behavior that ended in a contentious split between the Hughes and Arias. The prosecution's narrative was challenged by these revelations, but bolstered by testimony from Hughes and Travis's other girlfriends, who contested the claim of Travis's violent nature, portraying him as nonviolent and amiable. In the psychological battlefield of the courtroom, defense psychologist Richard Samuels presented a theory of Arias suffering from acute stress during the murder, 
suggesting her memory retention was compromised, entering a fight-or-flight response. His testimony was scrutinized, especially concerning the nature of Arius's stress response to alleged premeditated actions. Samuels also posited that Arius had PTSD, a point contested by the prosecution. Prosecutor Juan Martinez critiqued Samuels for his perceived compassion towards Arias, arguing this affected his professional judgment. In contrast, clinical psychologist Janine DeMart for the prosecution diagnosed Arias with borderline personality disorder, refuting claims of her being an abuse victim or having PTSD. The defense brought psychologist Robert Jeffner to challenge the prosecution's psychological assessment, arguing Arias suffered from an anxiety disorder due to trauma. Jeffner criticized the use of MMPI tests for diagnosing personality disorders, advocating instead for the Millen Clinical Multi-Axial Inventory, which Samuels had used. The prosecution countered with forensic neuropsychologist Jill Hayes, who defended the MMPI's utility in diagnosing borderline personality disorder, directly challenging Jeffner's critique. In the climatic moments of the trial, Prosecutor Juan Martinez delivered a closing argument that painted Jody Arias as a deceitful manipulator, reiterating the grave nature of her actions through the vivid presentation of crime scene photographs and pointedly highlighting a text message from Travis Alexander labeling Arias as evil. Martinez aimed to solidify Arias's image in the jury's mind as someone capable of cold, premeditated murder, criticizing her attempts to sway the jury's perception in her favor. Conversely, Arias' defense team urged the jury to look beyond personal biases against Arias, challenging the prosecution's narrative of premeditation as fundamentally flawed. They argued that Arias' actions prior to the murder, her visibility in security cameras, the preservation of gas can receipts, and her overnight stay at Alexander's home, contradicted the idea of a meticulously planned murder, proposing instead that these actions were not indicative of someone on a cover mission to kill. Martinez rebutted by emphasizing the brutal nature of Alexander's death, describing it as a slaughter to underscore the severity and intent behind Arias's actions. This back and forth set a starkly divided stage for the jury's deliberation. Throughout the trial, the jury's composition shifted due to various reasons. One juror was dismissed for misconduct, another for health reasons, and a third following an arrest for DUI, highlighting the intense and unpredictable nature of the trial proceedings. In their final instructions, jurors were told they could convict Arias of first-degree murder if they individually concluded that she had either premeditated the murder or committed it in the course of a felony. After 15 hours of careful deliberation, a decisive verdict was reached. Jody Arias was found guilty of first-degree murder with unanimous agreement on premeditation and a majority recognizing felony murder as well. It is ordered. The defendant shall be incarcerated in the Department of Corrections for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. The verdict's announcement was met with emotional relief from Alexander's family, who embraced each other in response to the long-awaited justice. Meanwhile, the atmosphere outside the courtroom mirrored the family's relief, with crowds cheering and chanting, marking the end of a trial that had captivated public attention with its dramatic turns and deeply contentious arguments. After Jody Arias was convicted of first-degree murder, the trial moved into the aggravation phase, where the prosecution needed to demonstrate that the murder was executed in a particularly cruel, heinous, or depraved manner to qualify Arias for the death penalty. This phase commenced on May 15, 2013, with the proceedings focused intently on the nature of Travis Alexander's death. The key testimony came from the medical examiner who conducted Alexander's autopsy. This phase was stark in its simplicity and gravity, with no array of witnesses, just the detailed and clinical recounting of the injuries that led to Alexander's death. Arias' defense team, having previously expressed a desire to withdraw from the case due to the strain of the prolonged legal battle, participated minimally, offering brief statements. They suggested that the adrenaline surging through Alexander's body during the attack might have dulled the pain of his fatal injuries an argument aimed at mitigating the perceived cruelty of the crime. Prosecutor Juan Martinez, in a poignant display meant to drive home the brutality of the murder, presented the jury with graphic photos of Alexander's body and the crime scene. In a particularly dramatic moment, Martinez paused for two minutes of silence during his closing arguments 
intending to give the jury a real-time sense of how long it took for Alexander to die. A powerful and somber illustration, meant to convey the prolonged suffering involved. The jury, after less than three hours of deliberation, concluded that the murder carried out by Arius met the legal criteria for cruelty, making her eligible for the death penalty. This swift decision reflected the impact of the evidence presented during this phase, particularly the visceral nature of the crime scene images and the testimony regarding Alexander's suffering. The penalty phase of Jody Arias' trial commenced on May 16, 2013, with the prosecution seeking to underscore the severity of her actions by calling Travis Alexander's family members to share victim impact statements. These emotionally charged statements aimed to convey the profound loss and suffering caused by Arias' crime, influencing the jury towards considering the death sentence. On May 21st, Arias herself addressed the court in an allocution where she shifted from her previous inclination towards the death penalty to pleading for life imprisonment. Arius articulated a new found perspective, claiming her initial death penalty preference was made without full understanding and acknowledging the additional grief her execution would bring to her family. Displaying a t-shirt emblazed with the word survivor, Arius proposed selling such merchandise to benefit domestic abuse victims and mentioned her contributions of hair donations to Locks of Love as evidence of her positive actions while in jail. In subsequent media interactions, including a joint interview with the Arizona Republic and NBC's Today, Arias expressed uncertainty about the jury's impending decision on her sentence. She articulated feelings of betrayal by the jury's conviction and described the surreal nature of facing the verdict, emphasizing the emotional toll on her family. On May 23rd, the sentencing phase of Jody Arias' trial culminated in a deadlock with the jury unable to unanimously agree on the death penalty, leading to an 8-4 vote on its favor. This division among the jurors reflected the profound difficulty and emotional toll of deciding a life-or-death sentence. And the mistrial declaration underscored the intense pressure and complexity of the case. Jury foreman Zervakos later expressed the jury's distress, noting their exhaustion and the shock of not reaching a conclusive end, feeling as though they had not fulfilled their duty highlighting the immense burden placed on them during this arduous process. In the wake of the hung jury, discussions about the next steps ensued. Montgomery, representing the prosecution, remained optimistic about the possibility of seating an impartial jury for a new trial. He hinted at the potential for negotiation, suggesting the victim's family might consent to a life sentence without parole, avoiding another emotionally charged trial. The defense highlighted the contention surrounding Arias's mental state, pointing out the paradox of seeking the death penalty for a defendant deemed mentally ill by the state's own psychologist and who had no previous criminal record. This argument aimed to challenge the pursuit of the death penalty, positioning Arias' case within broader debates about capital punishment and mental health. Arias herself, amidst these legal and ethical debates, stood by her belief in the criminal justice system while expressing skepticism about the feasibility of finding unbiased jurors for a new trial, given the extensive media coverage her case had received. Throughout the Jody Arias trial, her defense attorneys filed multiple motions for mistrial, particularly in January, April, and May of 2013, pointing to various alleged procedural and testimonial issues. In January, the defense contended that Mesa Police Detective Esteban Flores had committed pre-jury during a 2009 pre-trial hearing, which was crucial for deciding whether the death penalty could be pursued. Flores initially testified that Travis Alexander had been shot before being stabbed, based on his scene review and discussions with the medical examiner. However, this sequence was later contradicted by the medical examiner's testimony during the trial, suggesting the gunshot likely occurred post-stabbing and would have incapacitated Alexander, challenging the sequence of events Flores described. In May, the defense's motion highlighted that one of their witnesses had withdrawn from testifying due to receiving death threats, echoing earlier concerns where another defense witness, Alice Lavulette, also faced threats. These incidents were presented as part of a broader claim of an intimidating environment that compromised the defense's ability to present its case. The court, however, denied these motions including a subsequent request to pause the proceedings to appeal these decisions to the Arizona Supreme Court. Additionally, in late May 2013, 
the Arizona Supreme Court declined an appeal by Arias' defense that sought to invalidate the aggravating factor of cruelty used to qualify Arias for the death penalty. This appeal argued against the initial judicial finding of probable cause of cruelty, which was based on the initially alleged murder sequence proposed by Detective Flores. The defense's contention that the legal basis for the cruelty factor was flawed due to changing narratives about the murder sequence reflected the complex interplay between forensic evidence, witness testimony, and legal standards in the trial. On October 21, 2014, the sentencing retrial for Jody Arias commenced with fresh deliberations on evidence and witness testimonies. Among the witnesses was Amanda Webb, who had previously rebutted Arias' claim of returning a gas can to Walmart, a point used to question Arias' narrative of her actions around the time of the murder. In this retrial, Webb acknowledged the possibility of incomplete records transfer after the store's relocation, casting a shadow of doubt on the evidence's reliability from the first trial. The retrial continued into January 2015, revealing new twists, such as the admission by Mesa police experts of finding viruses and pornography on Alexander's laptop, contradicting earlier testimonies that negated such claims. These relevations complicated the already dense narrative of the case, providing new angles for the jury's consideration. Jury deliberations began on February 12, 2015, but soon hit a deadlock by March, with the jurors divided, leading to Arias' defense team requesting a mistrial. However, Judge Stephens urged further deliberations after denying the mistrial request. By March 5th, with the jury hopelessly deadlocked at 11 to 1 in favor of the death penalty, Stephens had no choice but to declare a mistrial, highlighting the deep divisions and emotional weight carried by the case. Post-mistrial, the lone holdout juror faced severe backlash, including threats and personal information leaks, drawing public and legal community concern over the integrity and safety of the jury service. This backlash prompted statements from legal officials, emphasizing the disgraceful nature of such attacks and the need for civility and respect in the judicial process. Alexander's aunt had this to say during the trial. My husband, my children, my nieces, my nephew, and myself will never be the people we were before June 4th, 2008, when Jody Arias savagely murdered my nephew, Travis Alexander. We all have a deep and unending sadness, which will be with us the rest of our lives. We have problems relating to our significant others and our friends who have never experienced such a senseless and horrific death of a loved one. We will never again be able to look at family photos of Travis and not think of his butchered, nearly decapitated body left to rot. Judge Stevens, I humbly implore you to sentence this unrepentant murderer to the maximum sentence of natural life. So she will never, ever again have that opportunity to destroy more innocent lives like she did to us and to Travis. The eventual sentencing on April 13, 2015, concluded with Arias receiving life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, marking the end of a protracted and costly legal battle that steered public and media frenzy. The financial toll of the trials, amounting to approximately $3 million, underscored the case's extensive demands on judicial resources. Moreover, in a restitution hearing in June 2015, Arias was ordered to pay over $32,000 to Alexander's siblings, reflecting a judicial attempt to provide some monetary redress for the immense personal loss suffered. On July 6, 2018, Jody Arias's legal team, led by attorneys Margaret M. Green, also known as Peg Green and Corey Engel, launched a significant legal challenge by filing a 324-page appeal to the Court of Appeals. Their goal was audacious, to have Arias's murder conviction overturned, arguing that the original trial had been fundamentally flawed. The crux of the appeal, presented on October 17, 2019, centered on the behavior of Prosecutor Juan Martinez during the trial. Arias's attorneys contended that Martinez's conduct not only was inappropriate, but also incited a media frenzy that negatively impacted the trial's fairness and outcome. They argued that these factors combined to undermine the judicial process, warranting a reversal of Arias's sentence. However, on March 24, 2020, the Court of Appeals rendered its decision. Despite acknowledging the egregious and self-prompting behavior of Martinez during the trial, 
the court concluded that the evidence of Aris' guilt was overwhelming. Thus, they upheld her murder conviction despite the prosecutorial misconduct highlighted by the appeal. As of 2023, Jody Arias is serving her sentence at the Arizona Department of Corrections, specifically in the Arizona State Prison Complex in Perryville, under the identification number 281129, initially placed in the High Security Lumley Unit, reflecting the severity of her crime and sentence. Arias has since been downgraded to medium security. The resolution of Jody Arias' trial and subsequent sentencing brought a sense of closure to the Alexander family, marking the end of a long, painful chapter in their lives. The family, who had endured the loss of Travis Alexander under tragic circumstances, finally saw the conclusion of a legal battle that captured national attention and evoked widespread emotional responses. They could now start to move forward, carrying the memory of Travis with them, but no longer tethered to the relentless cycle of court dates, media attention, and the replaying of his final moments. What are your views on Jody Arias' trial and its outcome? Do you think justice was served in this case? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. We would love to hear from you. If there is a case you would like us to cover, don't hesitate to share your suggestions in the comment section below. For more captivating true crime stories, like, share, and subscribe to our channel.